Have you experienced an unexpected financial setback? Is your child struggling to resist peer pressure or unwholesome influences from the internet? Have you been diagnosed with a life-threatening disease? Life in this wicked system can seem like a dark wilderness. We may feel alone, discouraged, and we just don't know where to turn. This is why more than ever, we need to strengthen our faith in God's Word. How does God's Word work in us? It has already transformed us into faithful servants of Jehovah God, but it also gives us the power to remain strong under difficult circumstances. This subject is timely because we live in a world where so many plant seeds of doubt about the Bible. They say it is something outdated or inaccurate. Imagine saying that it's inaccurate that the first woman was made from the rib of the first man after the two popped into existence 6,000 years ago in a garden with a talking snake. I mean, what's inaccurate about that? Beyond man's reach is the ability uh, to foresee the future in detail. Only Almighty God can do this. For example, Secular history tells us that in the year 539 BCE, a man named Cyrus conquered the land of Babylon and allowed thousands of Jewish captives to return home to restore true worship in Jerusalem. The Bible also tells us about these events, with one notable exception. While secular history recounts these events after they happened, the Bible foretold these events before they took place, in fact, some 200 years before. Let's take a closer look and see for ourselves. Uh, let's turn to Isaiah uh, chapter 44, Isaiah chapter 44, and we're going to read verses 27 and 28. The one saying to the deep waters, be evaporated, and I will dry up your rivers. The one saying of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he will completely carry out all my will. The one saying of Jerusalem, she will be rebuilt, and of the temple, your foundation will be laid. This isn't Jehovah God just guessing or trying to figure out the future. He's decided what will happen, and he will make it happen. How could the Bible predict this kind of detail some 200 years in advance? There is only one explanation. Turn a couple of chapters over to Isaiah chapter 46, and let's read a verse 10. From the beginning, I foretell the outcome, and from long ago, the things that have not yet been done. I say my decision will stand, and I will do whatever I please. It's fulfilled prophecies like these that build trust and confidence in God's Word. So, as you've probably gathered, Mark Numair is trying to convince us of the authenticity of the Bible as God's inspired, infallible Word. He's doing this in a talk titled, Why We Have Faith in God's Word. So we've just before him had David Schaefer giving us reasons, mostly, <laughs> arguments from fine-tuning, but reasons to believe in a God. His talk was why we have faith in God's existence. Now it's Mark Numa's turn to argue that not only does God exist, but specifically God is the God of the Bible, and God wrote the Bible, and here are the reasons for insisting on this. And he's reaching for this tired old example from Isaiah chapters 44 and 45, where it supposedly predicts the fact that Cyrus would conquer Babylon in 539 BCE. Mark Numair, as we've heard, is convinced there's only one explanation for this. How could the Bible predict this kind of detail some 200 years in advance? There is only one explanation. It's fulfilled prophecies like these that build trust and confidence in God's word. There's only one explanation as far as Mark Numair is concerned. And if this is Mark Numair's conclusion, 
as someone speaking on behalf of the faithful slave. This needs to be everyone's conclusion. This needs to be your conclusion. The only acceptable conclusion is that Isaiah was clairvoyant. Isaiah had special powers where he could see into the future and write down the name Cyrus 200 years in advance, apparently. He wrote down the name Cyrus as the name of the ruler who would take Babylon. But is that the only explanation? Well, presumably you're already one or two steps ahead of me here. <laughs> Fairly obviously there is another explanation, and that's that this prophecy wasn't written at the time that Mark Numair and other Bible literalists say. And indeed, that's precisely what we find when we turn to Bible scholars. Now, what I've been doing in some of these rebuttals previously is pointing you to the Wikipedia page titled Dating the Bible, which tells you when various books of the Bible were written. But I'm mindful of not leaning too much on Wikipedia. I think it's a very useful resource when it comes to, at a glance, seeing what scholars have to say, never mind what fundamentalist Bible literalists like Mark Numair have to say, who clearly have a horse in the race, <laughs> their position within a fundamentalist group rides heavily on their ability to convince people of their standing or of the importance of adhering to the organisation of which they are prominent members. But what do scholars have to say about when Isaiah was written? Well, let's, instead of going to Wikipedia, this time let's go straight to the Encyclopedia Britannica. And let's go to the entry for Isaiah. And if we scroll down to where it says the prophecies of first Isaiah, it says first Isaiah contains the words and prophecies of Isaiah, a most important 8th century BCE prophet of Judah, written either by himself or his contemporary followers in Jerusalem, circa 740 to 700 BCE, along with some later editions such as chapters 24 to 27 and 33 to 39. So straight away, I should just interject, we're learning that there are different divisions of the book of Isaiah, and we're learning that as far as scholars have been able to figure out, there have been so-called editions. If there can be editions to a book that purports to be a book of prophecy, a book that is supposedly predicting future events, surely we can see scope here for one of these additions to be a prophecy that is written after the fact, and therefore not really a prophecy, just sounding as though Isaiah had it all together and was able to predict things that would happen hundreds of years in the future. Anyway, let's carry on reading. The first of these two editions was probably written by a later disciple or disciples of Isaiah about 500 BCE. The second edition is divided into two sections, chapters 33 to 35, written during or after the exile to Babylon in 586 BCE, and chapters 36 through 39, which drew from the source used by the Deuteronomic historian in 2 Kings chapters 18 to 19. The second major section of Isaiah, which may be designated 2nd Isaiah, even though it has been divided because of chronology into Deutero-Isaiah and Trito-Isaiah, was written by members of the school of Isaiah in Babylon, chapters 40 to 55, that's our section, chapters 40 to 55 were written prior to and after the conquest of Babylon in 539, by the Persian king Cyrus II the Great, and chapters 56 to 66 were composed 
after the return from the Babylonian exile in 538. The canonical book of Isaiah, after editorial redaction, probably assumed its present form during the 4th century BCE. Isaiah, I'm sorry to tell you this, Bible literalists and those who take a fundamentalist position on this, Isaiah wasn't written by just one bloke called Isaiah. It may have started that way, but it certainly didn't finish that way. It was a work in progress over the course of centuries. And I have another book here. This is a fairly recent book, A History of the Bible, The Book and Its Faiths by John Barton. And I looked up what John Barton, John Barton, by the way, is a Bible scholar and theologian, and I believe an Anglican priest. So he's a theist. And here's what he has to say. In the case of Isaiah, I should say this is from page 108. In the case of Isaiah, as we have seen, additional material is not only from the exilic and early post-exilic ages, and then he cites chapters 40 to 66, again, the section in question, but also probably from a still later time. In the case of the apocalypse in 24 through 27, we could have oracles from the Hellenistic period. So we must assume that in addition to the exilic editing of the pre-exilic prophets, Similar processes of addition and revision happened among scribal circles after the exile and indeed well down into the age of the Second Temple. Updating prophetic books was clearly an important industry among these scribes who we may guess were attached to the Jerusalem Temple now that there was no longer a royal court or else worked in the administration of the province of Yehud. So when you actually consult what scholars have to say, it turns out that there isn't just one explanation for how Isaiah could have foreseen that Cyrus would take Babylon. It turns out there is an alternative, and indeed an alternative that makes far more sense, namely that the material in question concerning Cyrus was included as an addition after the fact because we're talking about a man-made document written by humans rather than something that is infallible, inspired by God and therefore capable of glimpsing into the future. 